My name is Jacob Ritchie, and I've gone to this church my whole life. My mom is helping me say this because I have trouble with my words. I was born early and was very sick. I was in the hospital a lot. I had oxygen and a feeding tube until I was seven. I have had 12 surgeries. Doctors told my mom I might not walk or talk, and my church prayed for me a lot. Doctors found out I have a genetic condition called Q22 deletion. I don't fully understand what that means. I asked Jesus to be in my heart in Miss Sally's class, but I don't remember when exactly. I thought everyone had Jesus in their heart. I've always loved to listen to the music in church and still do. The Breakfast Club has prayed for me, and I have made new friends from there. I am now 13 and in middle school. I really like going to Heroes Camp and Mike Denny's class. I have made new friends there who are nice to me. I am excited to be baptized because I love Jesus in church. Thank you for praying for me. My name is Nikki Bella. Today I am being baptized to celebrate a change in my life that happened years ago. Fear stopped me from outwardly celebrating such a momentous occasion. It has been a bumpy, detour-filled road, but God led me right back where I needed to be. I married at a young age and learned the struggles of piecing together two lives that weren't ready. After an ugly three-year marriage, I felt alone and like a complete failure to God. Satan loves having us feel like a failure and separated from the people who love us. What I needed was forgiveness. I begged God to forgive me, but that felt useless. I was miserable. After taking the time to actually talk to God, I realized my problem. God had already forgiven me. I didn't need his forgiveness. I needed to accept his forgiveness and forgive myself. God led me to VNC with the help of my family. I became a member through the 101 class and joined a life group. The people I met there changed my life forever. God has used our group in many ways, and I am thankful for them every day. My story has taught me to move on from the past and embrace what blessings are in my future. What we have been through prepares us for where we are going and the people we will meet. Trust in the Lord to influence people's lives with your journey. Be quick to forgive instead of letting Satan bully you with your past. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your goodness shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Don't allow fear and anxiety to stop you from celebrating what God has done in your life.
my name is Glenn Schneegus. John 3:16. for God so loved the world. Going through my first divorce in 2008, life was rough and I was getting kicked around in court daily. I had to start all over, broke, no furniture, and plenty of attorney fees. I even had to sleep in my truck for a while until I found a rundown trailer. I decided to ask for help and I asked God for help. I prayed and prayed for months until one day I finally blurted out, help me God and I will go to church. I knew I should not crack deals with God, but things changed. Not wanting to lie to God, the next Sunday I got up, got dressed, and off to church I went. I liked it so much that 10 years later, here I am. I've been asking my dad to take this next step of baptism with me. He finally said yes, and I'm thrilled today to have my dad, my pal, my friend doing this with me. My name is Ralph Schneegus. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I've had a great 86 years so far, but I never expected to be here today or even attending church. In 1963, my sister was killed in a terrible fashion and I had always said that there was no God. A God would not allow this to happen. Every Sunday was a day for me and my son, Glenn. However, I always had to wait until he was done at church. I was curious and intrigued. He would not miss one service. He knew my feelings on religion, so he never asked me to go with him. One day, as he was leaving, I asked if I could go. I found that church had been that missing piece, the piece to fill the empty void I had, that void that I had for Christ. Today, five years later, I love my church. I love God. I love life, and my heart is full and complete. I love the people and the warmth of VNC so much that I attend both services. God is great. Man, I just, it's just fun, isn't it? It's just plain fun. And here's the cool part. Those people, everyone that got baptized, taking next steps in their faith and following Jesus, and we get to be a part of it. And it's a great reminder that we're a part of it. As the church, we come together and we walk this journey out together. Now, if you are a guest with us today and you are not following Jesus, you're still trying to figure that whole thing out. I, I want to let you know, um, part of what we talk about today will may connect more with those who are going, yeah, I'm following him, but I, I hope you keep your heart open. But I hope you also realize as we talk about what we talk about today that uh, the people following Jesus, they don't have it all figured out. They're not perfect. They are walking out their faith one day at a time, trusting him and believing and knowing that they are loved. So let me start with a simple question for all of us in this room, and it is this. Is there an obstacle that stands in the way of you growing in your faith? Is there an obstacle that stands in the way of you experiencing the best that God has for you? Now, if you're not following Jesus yet, I, I want to help you know that the biggest obstacle that separates you from God, he already took care of, all right? It's this thing called sin, and when Jesus died on the cross for all of us, it was with great love and, and great compassion that he died on the cross for our sins. You and I have to choose to receive that love and to let that love transform us and change us. So I want to invite you to understand that truth as we begin talking today. And as we talk today, we're going to go on a journey through Scripture in the Old Testament, 
and I'm going to take you on a journey through part of my own life. Now, today's set, you're seeing the, 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 everything that's ready to go for Fam Jam that kicks off next week. Like Chris said, be here some way, shape, or fashion, whether you're participating in the experience, uh, maybe you're volunteering, or maybe you're helping make some of the supplies and the stuff happen so that uh, the event can unfold. There's information out the, in the foyer. Make sure you check that out. But with this set, we are going to go into an adventure called Fam Jam Camp. Now, for the next three weeks, for those of you who will be here on the weekends, we're going to be also going to a different kind of camp. We're going to be going to the camp that was set up outside the walls of Jericho by the Israelites. And when we go there over the next three weeks, we're going to take in three different vantage points. We're going to take in three different perspectives of the walls of Jericho following them. Sorry, spoiler alert, the walls of Jericho, God took them down, all right? God made the wall fall. So just so you know that ahead of time, it'll help you as you process through what we talk about today. But in the next three weeks, we're going to take in these different vantage points. We're going to take in these three different perspectives, some that had an immediate impact on someone's life and, and in some ways that had a future impact on their perspective of life. Now, as we go on this journey, I want to tell you that today is actually a sermon that I preached about 10 years ago. And I preached it here in this room, and um, it was, I, I guess I'm saying that because if you were here 10 years ago, forgive the repeat, um, but I, I believe God spoke through it in those moments and just praying about it and thinking on it, I believe, I'm hoping that God will once again speak through these words today. And as I tell uh, the, the sermon today, I do want to reiterate, Jesus spoke in parables, and when he did that, he, he spoke to real life situations when he was trying to help people make sense of scripture and in different ways. And, and today, as I share uh, my own story with you, I'm hoping that it as well aligns with the scripture and just gives some more clarity to whatever God may be wanting to say to you. Now, we're going to be in the Old Testament, but we're, we're talking about following Jesus. And if you're going to follow Jesus, that means you got to walk with him. And walking with Jesus, I just want you to understand, all of us to hopefully be in agreement, that doesn't just mean he's going to enhance your life. It means he's going to transform your life. All right? It's not just looking out for something in a goodie bag. You know, it's sort of like uh, when, when he was sharing his story and talking about, I realized I shouldn't be trying to wheel and deal with God. It was, it was this understanding that I get this beautiful opportunity to walk with him and that he's going to change me. And that out of his love, he's going to change me and make me more and more like him. And, and as we walk with him, it means we're going to be transformed. Now, as you're walking out each and every one of those next steps of following Jesus, as you take every next step, occasionally somewhere along the way, you may encounter an obstacle. You may encounter something that is, well, it's holding you back. It's blocking the way from you experiencing fully what it is to live for God at, at its best. Now, those obstacles come in many different ways. Now, I think sometimes there are times where God puts the obstacle in our way because we've gotten off the path and we've wandered in a different direction and he's trying to get us back where we need to be. Sometimes I think obstacles happen just because of this thing called life. And we live life and there are some things in this fallen world that just happen and so those impact us as well. I do think there are times, well, I think there are times that these obstacles happen because of our own choices. And then sometimes we have obstacles even in our faith journey because of someone else's choices. What are you going to do about those obstacles that have risen in front of you that are holding you back from fully experiencing what it is to follow Jesus? Joshua is the scripture and the story we're going to pick up on around the walls of Jericho, but I want us to go back a little bit further in Joshua's story. Uh, Joshua uh, was, I imagine, sitting at a, a camp just reflecting and thinking through all that God has done. He was there when God showed up and brought the Israelites out of Egypt. If you think back to the cartoon movie, The Prince of Egypt, if you think to the movie, The Ten Commandments, it's the story of the Exodus. It is the story that takes place where God brought the Israelites out of slavery into freedom out of Egypt. Joshua was there. He got to see God do that. He, he was there when God split the Red Sea. When, when God did that, he was one of the people that got to walk across on that dry ground to get to the other side. He had seen God do these amazing things. Now, Joshua was even there when Moses, when they, when they arrived at the edge of this promised land that God had promised to them. Joshua was there when, when Moses said, I'm going to send some people in. I'm going to send some spies. They're going to go in a little covert operation. I want them to go in and investigate the land. And so that's what they did. And they went in there and they realized, man, this place is beautiful. This place is amazing. But there are some things 
that are a little scary. There are some things about it that seem really intimidating. And, and so of all of those that went in, Joshua and his buddy Caleb, who we'll talk about in a couple weeks, they were the only two that came out and said, you know what? This is amazing. Yeah, there are some things that are a little intimidating, a little scary, but we can trust God. We can trust God that he's going to get us into that promised land. He's going to give us what he promised. We, we just need to trust him. But the problem was everyone else that went with him in that group chose to operate in fear. And so because of their choices, the people of the Israelite nation chose to believe those who operated in fear and not trusting God, and they found themselves spending 40 years wandering in the desert. And Joshua would walk with them all 40 years. Now part of that experience was God saying, listen, those those of you who made that choice not to trust me, you are not going to go into the promised land. Now, your grandkids, your kids, they're going in because I'm following through on what I said. But, but those of you who chose not to trust me, you're not going to go in. Well, even though Joshua and Caleb were two of the ones that were in that generation, they did trust God. And so they would find themselves in this unique place of they would be leading the next generation into the promised land. If you got your Bibles, I want you to go to Joshua chapter 1. Uh, you can also follow along on YouVersion Live. Uh, if you've got that app, uh, you can just, if you just do Bible app and search the, search the store, you'll find that. You go under events, you'll find us there, Valparaiso Nazarene Church. Joshua chapter 1, right here at the beginning, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' is aid. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. If you go on and keep reading, he actually defines the land a little bit and, and the space that is that promised land, this area called Canaan. And he gives them some reminders of, you've got to trust me in what I've said. You've got to trust and put these words in essence on your heart and believe in them. And then you go on down to verse 9. He speaks these words. He says, uh, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Well, Joshua heard those words, and he did what God said, and he told the people. He said, listen, you got, you got three days. I want this word to go through camp that everybody needs to get ready, because three days from now, we are going to go, and we're going to cross the Jordan River. I don't know how God's going to do it, but we're going to get across, and we're going to possess the land God has promised. So now here we are, and you have him wondering, how in the world is God going to do this? But believing that he would. How many of the obstacles that are in the way of you growing spiritually, of you experiencing God to the to fullest, how many of those obstacles are something where you just need to have Joshua's mindset, where it's this idea of, you know what, I don't know exactly how you're going to do this, God, but I choose to believe that you will, that you're going to help this obstacle be gone. Years ago, back in the gym here, almost probably 10 years ago, maybe a little more, I was playing basketball uh, during the week, early in the mornings. We have a group of guys. They'll get together. You're welcome to come join. They, I think they play on Wednesday mornings now. You should really check with the office because now I'm making stuff up. But I know that they still play. <laughs> and it's just pickup games. Sometimes you're running and gun, sometimes half board, whatever. We were playing ball. I was out there. And um, those of you who understand basketball, I'll exp I'm going to explain what just happened. You will appreciate my uh, stupidity in what I was doing. I, all I had to do was take a simple shot. Okay, nobody was guarding me, nobody was anywhere near me, but I decided to do a little fadeaway action. I decided I was gonna go a little old school, do a little sky hook. I mean, I, I was going for it in that moment. And um, those of you my age, older, we're talking James Worthy, we're talking Kareem. Uh, those of you a little younger, don't know those names, I was pretty much LeBron James. <laughs> Maybe not. But I take my shot, and when I jump to take my shot, all of a sudden I feel something in my, my ankle, and I know something's not right. And so I go to the ground. I, I have no clue if I made the shot, but I go to the ground. And when I stand back up, my good foot is able to stand on the basketball court. My bad foot now feels like it's in two or three inches of sand. So I know something's not right. And I had ruptured my Achilles tendon. Your Achilles tendon is what connects from your calf down to basically the bottom of your foot. And, and for me, it was... A bad injury, it was going to require surgery to fix. Now, I didn't have a lot of pain in the actual injury when it took place, like some people do. My pain came mainly after surgery. But it wasn't just physical pain. 
There was also pain for me of re realizing it's my right foot. For the next three months, I can't drive. I got to let somebody drive me everywhere. And I had friends who came and literally drove me everywhere almost every day. It also meant that there were other things that I was so used to taking care of myself with, but I had to be dependent upon someone else. I found myself extremely frustrated, extremely frustrated. I still remember the day. I wish I could tell you I was laying in my bed deep in prayer or deep in the scriptures, but the truth is I was on Google. And I was looking on Google, looking for resources to help me and to give me information, articles, different blogs, different posts on, on somebody who had walked through an Achilles uh, injury like this and, and their recovery process. And I ended up settling in on one. Instead of reading so many that were all over the map, some really sad, like your leg fell off, and then some that were really good, I decided to settle on one in particular that just simply was a guy who, a year after his injury, would go and run in a full Ironman. Now, an Ironman is a triathlon. That means you swim, that means you bike, and you run. Well, I stuck to just reading his story because I was curious to hear how it unfolded, but as well, it became a goal for me. Now, I, I, didn't, I wasn't crazy enough to say I want to run a full Ironman. I just decided to run the half Ironman, so I'm like aluminum man, all right? And so I settled for that. And, and the distance that you got to do there, it's a 1.2-mile swim, and then as soon as you get out of the water, you got to go ride a bike for 56 miles, and then after that, you go and run 13.1 miles. Now, um, it's a little crazy. I, mean, I didn't say it was my brightest day, but I went into physical therapy and said, that's my goal. And so they started working with me, and eventually you get the cast off. You go from the cast to the boot. From the boot, you go to just crutches. Then from crutches, they taught you how to walk. And if you've ever had this kind of injury, you know what I mean, how cool it is when you finally get to walk again. And then I was getting to run, sort of. It wasn't pretty, but I started to run. And it was in those moments when I had already shared this goal with others, and I realized I'm a little in over my head. Because not only do I, I've never done this to this extent, but I don't have the experience of it and I don't have the knowledge. I was in a tough spot because I was in over my head with something that I didn't know how to do. Joshua found himself sitting at camp, a new camp, because God had come through. God had allowed them to cross over the Jordan River, and so now they were in the promised land and they set up camp in a place where they were able to see this city called Jericho their obstacle. Jericho was surrounded with these walls, and, and here is Joshua just sort of taking it all in, and he's, he's the commander of the army, so he's trying to think through what is my next strategy, what's my next step, and it, the scriptures tell us that in that moment when he's sitting there, all of a sudden a man shows up with a sword drawn. Now Joshua, very courageous, walks right up to this guy, mano mano, and he gets in his face. I, mean, I didn't get in his face, but I'm making up scripture now. That's not good. He, he walks up to him, and he says, are you for us or are you for the enemy? And this man with the sword said, neither. I want you to go to Joshua chapter 5. I want us to take a look at this section of Scripture. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. What I love about this section of the scripture is that they have already crossed the Jordan. They've gotten to that other side. And now they stand, and they're set up camp and they're looking at this Jericho. They're looking at the walls. What's your Jericho? What's that obstacle that we talked about earlier that's standing in between you experiencing the best that God has for you, what it means to fully follow him? Can you name it? Can you name the wall? And if you can't name one right now, maybe you can think back on one that along the way you're like, yeah, that was an obstacle God had to remove because it was standing in the way of me fully, just fully engaging with him. What's your Jericho? What's your wall? Joshua was scouting the city, and in that moment as he encountered this man, I want you to remember Joshua was tough, he was a warrior, but in this moment when he realized it was God, he yielded to God. I would even suggest that he submitted to God's authority. Let me ask you a question. Do you submit to God's authority in your life? 
I mean, when it comes to what we can read from Scripture and how we get to know the heart of God and who he is, do you submit to the authority of this? Do you submit to the authority of God in your life to where you want what God wants, where his best is your best, and you trust him in that? The reasons why I believe that, that Joshua was submitting to his authority is we see that when it talked about him laying face down, what I say, he de- said he did it in reverence. So there was an acknowledgement of God in that moment. And then I even love the language that's at the end of that section we just read when it talked about the sandals. Because what did God say to him? He said, you, you need to take the sandals off. It's holy ground. And then the simple last words that we read was Joshua did so. He submitted himself to God's authority in his life. When he would lay down face first before him, not only was it reverent, but it was an act of surrender. Remember, he's a soldier. And a soldier, especially in that day, um, now we don't know if he had a full set of armor on at this moment or if he was just in his e- evening attire, whatever it was. He, we just know that in that moment, he has laid down before this guy that's got a drawn sword, and he is, in essence, exposing the back of his neck. In doing that, it is this moment of surrender. It is this moment of submitting to his authority. Now, when I get into the heart of Scripture and I go through it, I, I see throughout Scripture there is this concept, there's this truth of you and I submitting that to his authority and not only doing that, but that you and I surrender to his will. We say, not my will, but your will be done. We surrender to his will. We trust him. We trust him. I know that sounds so simple, but I think that that is at the heart of what we're talking about here is if you want to see the obstacle that's in the way of you getting closer to Jesus, trust him. Trust him to help move the obstacle, to help move the walls. Remember the spoiler alert. It is through God that the wall fall. Now, when we look at this and we see him acknowledging his authority, surrendering his life, trusting him, I wonder if we can trace our own spiritual defeats back to times where we don't submit to his authority, to times when we don't trust the times where we're more focused on our will than his, and, and then we wonder what in the world's going on when we come to these walls. Maybe part of the path of approaching those walls, those obstacles, is already operating in an obedience that's rooted in trust and love and grace. And sometimes it's not just the obstacle itself that came to your mind. Sometimes I think the wall, the obstacle, is your response to those things that happen in your life that are out of your control. Am I going to respond in a way that's submitting myself to God's authority? Am I going to respond in a way that is a will surrendered to him? Am I going to respond in a way that looks like Jesus? Any wall, no matter what kind it is, if it impacts your relationship with Jesus, it needs to fall. When I started preparing for my race, um, it was very ill-prepared is probably the best way to put it. I, I, you would think I went out and asked for help, but instead what happened was I, I had called a couple different people and just told them what I was doing. But a dear friend of mine, a mentor, someone who I knew from the age 18 uh, up until the last several years uh, before he died, I mean, this guy was in my life, he contacts me. And let me know that, hey, listen, I, I know you're doing this race. I, I should have been looking for him. He found me. And Dan didn't, his name was Dan, and he didn't just say, sign up. He calls me to tell me, I'm going to do the race with you. Jesus doesn't invite you to follow him and take next steps with him by just saying, hey, just say this prayer and you're good to go. No, what he does, he invites you and says, come on. I'm going to take this journey with you. I'm going to walk with you through this whole thing. I'm with you. Don't doubt that. Believe that. Now, Dan, the way Dan would continue on in that is constant contact with me. He was sending me emails. He was calling me on the phone. We would go train together. He would send me texts. And it seems like no matter which one of those were taking place, he would always have these phrases come out of his mouth of going, you can do this. Don't quit. Make sure you're always taking that next step. Never stop taking the next step. And he would always encourage me with that. Listen, Jesus encourages you on this walk. Jesus encourages you even as you're dealing with the different walls in life because he comes alongside of us. He gives us his book. He may not be writing you an email, but he sure has a lot in here that can speak into the heart of your journey if you'll take it to heart. Now, I've never gotten a text from God. Don't even try to get funny right now. But I've, I've had 
those times where, whether it's been maybe through a song that we sang, because of the way it was written, that somebody was expressing themselves to God, that it became a beautiful expression for myself where I would have this moment of encouragement from God. It's also been so many times through other believers speaking into my life that I have found those type of encouragement of where I know that, man, Jesus, you really do care about me. And part of what I love about what Dan said to me in all of this was he said, I want to run this race with you. Do you understand? Jesus wants to walk with you. He wants to. You're not a have to for him. He wants to. He loves you. He likes you. He wants to walk out your spiritual journey with him each and every step along the way. Go to Joshua chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpet, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the walls of the city will collapse and the army will will go up, everyone straight in. Some of the obstacles in our journey to follow Jesus can feel really massive. But maybe our relationship with Jesus is bigger than you think. And what I, what I mean by that is when you think of the walls of Jericho that they would see, I wonder if they looked so intimidating, so overwhelming, that they would think that those walls surround the whole promised land. They didn't. They were just around that city. And maybe... Maybe they could have ignored it right then and said, you know what, Uh, we're just going to maneuver around that. We're going to go deal with the rest of the promised land, and we're not going to touch this part. But eventually, if they were going to experience what God had promised them, if they're going to fully experience God's best, then they would have had to circle back and dealt with it anyways. But instead, God was calling them to deal with it now. And the same goes for us. What's the name of your Jericho? What's the name of your wall? We all have these walls in our lives that sometimes stand between us and the best God has for us. Stop avoiding it. Stop avoiding it. Deal with it. Let God deal with it. Because remember, with God, the wall will fall. Now, on race day, it was the first time I'd ever done a major event like this. First time I'd ever competed in this type of uh, half Ironman. And I found myself severely undertrained, and I was nervous beyond belief unbelievably nervous. I got a chance to see Dan before the race began, but there were about a thousand of us in the race, and he and I are a different age, so his group was going to start the race about 30, 45 minutes before I did. So when I went up to my section, I was hoping I was going to be near the front, so that way, you know, man, we could, I would be surrounded with people the whole time, but instead, I was not. I was the second to last group to get to go. The group behind me, I was in my mid-30s, okay? The group behind me was uh, people between the age of 18 and 22. Those of you in your 30s and 40s, that makes sense. Those of you, you'll catch on in a second. But I started the swim. Before I finished the swim, the entire group behind me had passed me. And now I found myself feeling like I am in dead last after I get out of the water. I get on my bike, I go on a 56 grueling, 56-mile bike ride, and then we get to the run. Now, in that 13.1-mile run, I hit the runner's wall. And the runner's wall, if you're not familiar with it, is where just your your body and your mind start having an argument. And there starts being this conversation in your head of just, you know, saying, you're done. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. The problem is I hit the wall of the 13.1. I hit the wall at mile three. And you literally hear these whispers in your head of, just quit. This is stupid. What are you doing? You can't do this. This isn't worth it. How many times does the enemy speak that into your life? How many times do you sometimes say that to yourself? When it comes to walking out your spiritual faith, you find yourself going, just quit. You can't really do this. God can't really take that obstacle away. Is it really worth it? And you debate with your own flesh. 
You debate with your own flesh and you fight temptations and you hear the voice in your head saying, don't give up, don't surrender. Don't submit yourself to God's authority. You trust you. And those kind of walls seem so permanent. Look at verse 20, Joshua chapter 6. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. I want you to catch it. Before the wall fell, remember what they had instructed them to do a little bit ago. God said, you're going to what? You're going to walk around that city six times. And then on the seventh day, you're going to walk around that city another time. Now, to go and walk like that meant there had to be this level of obedience. Now, I don't want you to, to miss what kind of obedience it is. It's not about you just doing what's right. It's an obedience that's rooted in faith. It's an obedience that's rooted in trust. It's an obedience that's rooted in knowing God loves me, and he genuinely cares about me. And he's given me all these different things of encouragement to let me know that, and so I believe and know that these walls can fall. Another part that I love in this part of the story is when you look at that section of Scripture, and it talks about them going around that seventh time, did you catch that they shouted before the walls fell down? When you go to a ball game, when somebody hits a home run, you shout after the home run. When you're watching a basketball game, you shout after the basket's made. He's telling them, you're going to shout before you see the wall fall. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you believe in God's love for you that much that you will believe and choose to say, you know what, I'm going to operate with full submission to his authority in my life. I'm going to surrender my will to his will. And I'm going to walk in an obedience that's so rooted in faith that I will praise him even before the wall falls down. If we can get that, if we can truly get that, then I think in those moments, you will leave behind your own power and ability, and you will enter into the power of God. And that is when we see the walls fall. When I hit mile 12 of the 13.1 miles, I was exhausted. I was struggling. It had been a hard run. Now, I got to tell you, in my mind, before the race, I thought by this point I would have the most beautiful stride running into the finish line. I would be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That was what was in my head. But the reality was I just was walking it in. I think some of, you, some of us sometimes think that in our spiritual walk, that once we start following Jesus, that you're going to be frolicking through the fields of flowers and just skipping and bubbly all the time. But honestly, following Jesus for me has probably been a little bit more like that triathlon. There are some times where I'm running, but there's also some times where it's just a walk, maybe a crawl, but still wanting, desiring to take that next step. I, I came around to mile 12, and when I got to the, it, you would come over a little hill, and then you would see this turn, and there sitting on the curb, there sitting on the curb was Dan. We had met on the bikes for a split second, and Dan once again was just saying, you can do it, you're going to finish. But it was like, you know, it's, and he was gone. But at this point, here he is, he's on the curb, he stands up, and once again, Dan's saying to me, you can do this. Don't quit. You're going to finish this race. And then he would run and walk with me as far as he was allowed to get me to the finish line. Listen, Jesus is your biggest fan. You will find no one who believes in you more than he does. And no matter how big the obstacle may seem, no matter how massive the wall is that you would name as something between you and you experiencing God's fullness and the best of God, Jesus is the one who will help that wall fall. And he will be with you every moment of that. Around here, we use the language of walking, hoping, running, walking, soaring. All of that we do with trust. Because at the core of it, we have to trust him. Before the walls fell down, they walked in obedience. They shouted in obedience, rooted in faith. And it was a shout of triumph. It was a shout of faith, a shout of trust. It was a shout that would encourage others around them and a shout that would put fear in the enemy. 
I don't know exactly what their shout sounded like. It doesn't tell us. But for today, I wonder if it sounded a little bit like you did just a few minutes ago. Whoa, 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 whoa. I can't promise you in this moment that the wall that stands in your way will fall today. But I can promise you that Jesus loves you and he is with you and he is your greatest fan. And if today is a day for you to just stand up and walk around the city and choose to praise him even before the wall falls, maybe that's where you start. Because my fear is that some of us have been setting up camp and just staring at the wall. We've just been staring at our pain. We've been staring at that bitterness. We've been staring at the sin. We've been just staring at it because it looks so intimidating and overwhelming. It's there where I think instead of it being a wall, we see it as a dead end. But it's not a dead end. You need to see it like the walls of Jericho. And let me remind you again, because of God, the wall would fall. And whatever the wall is you're facing, Jesus is here to invite you to see that wall fall.